So everybody happy about Tiger Woods yesterday? Yeah. yeah. Poignant, given it was yeah. Augusta. Augusta, <coughs> which was made famous by CBS. Looks like a uh, typical Easter week. We used to have Easter week off. Why not anymore? A lot of people also went to Boston today. Patriots Day. Yeah. It's a holiday in Rhode Island, Boston. Is it the, not the marathon? Is it the marathon? Uh, well, today it's the marathon. Patriots Day. So. Happy so, Patriots Day. Danny, why did they go? Because of the party. Or the party. <laughs> Okay, close your phones, computers, and we will have a party here. <laughs> Take a piece of paper. What I'd like you to do is identify from Evan's presentation ten key points. So your party is getting extra credit for your participation today. <clears throat> not extra credit. Anybody here would have gotten the credit. But if you're not here, you can you can submit it this week or well we don't meet next week so the following week come on Anthony shut the door again okay Anthony's uh, anybody behind you all right I have a uh, a great pleasure today to uh, introduce Evan Weiner, uh, who is a friend. He's also an author, a speaker, an entrepreneur, um, has written a book on sport and politics, and has been speaking here at Sacred Heart, what, 15 years or so? 2004. I 2000. remember when this campus was much smaller. So, um, Evan's going to talk, and he's probably someone, and I don't know the entire universe, but someone who knows more about sport media and the historical context of sport media than anyone I know. Um, so your job today is to identify key issues, uh, key individuals who contributed to the growth of sport media. So his talk is sport media and money, of course, without money, nothing. So um, that's your task, and uh, Evan, I'll let you get started. Thanks, Jim, uh, and thank you for having me today. Uh, how many of you watched this last Monday night? How many of you don't know what that is? That's uh, from Minneapolis last night. How many week. made money? How many gambled on it? Yeah, they admit it, too. They Any, admit it. Anyone make money? Oh, okay, right, Robert. Good. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, as you know, Kentucky won the national championship last week, and it was in Minneapolis. It was a big event. Sports has had big events leading up to this one throughout the last 98 years. Uh, before I get on to this, let's talk a little bit about this guy, who is David Stern, who is the commissioner of the National Basketball Association who actually taught me a lot about this business when I was covering him as a reporter. There are three things that you need to know that makes sports in the United States go. Government support, TV, corporate support. 
Not really going to talk about government support today, not going to talk about corporate support, but I'm going to talk about TV and radio, because without government there is no TV, no radio. In fact, I don't know if you know this or not, but we the people actually own over-the-air TV and also the radio waves. And there was a guy by the name of David Sarnoff who figured this out through the sinking of the Titanic on April 15, 1912, and there's a very long story behind it. But with the sinking of the Titanic now 107 years ago, Sarnoff figured out communications. And he happened to be working for the Marconi Wireless uh, at uh, John Wanamaker's in New York, hooked up with something called Radio Corporation of America. And this frequency, the spectrum, was given to the public. Uh, Sarnoff put all this stuff together. He knew he had to sell radios in. Let me ask you a question. If you're selling anything, what do you need? If you're selling radio, selling TV, even Amazon Prime, what do you need? You need a product, right? Because are you going to buy a radio with it? While well, you looking at the age group, how many of you actually own radios in here? Figured, zero. Uh, anyway, you wouldn't buy a radio, you wouldn't buy a TV unless there's a product. And Sarnoff figured out the product. On July 2nd, and that's 1921, he got the rights to a boxing match between Jack Dempsey and George Carpentier. Uh, he had developed something called a radio music box. It was a radiola. It cost 75 bucks in those days. But he figured out you needed more than just some radio, so he decided to buy a prize boxing or a championship fight with Dempsey. Dempsey probably at that point in 1921 was the biggest name in the world. He was the heavyweight boxing champion. He was up there with Charlie Chaplin. Here, you know who Charlie Chaplin is? The actor. He's up there with Charlie Chaplin, ahead of Babe Ruth, because Babe Ruth was now up and coming, ahead of Rudolph Valentino, ahead of Red Grange, the galloping ghost, who was a big football star in the 1920s, head of Al Jolson. So Dempsey was the guy, and Sarnoff rolls the dice and says, if I get Dempsey, people will listen to the fight. 90,000 people, 91,000 people in Jersey City come to see a fight between Jack Dempsey and Carpentier. Wasn't much of a fight. Uh, it was the first... I would just like to interject the yeah. importance of that. Yeah. This, the 90,000 yeah. people were uh, seated or standing yeah. in a totally wooden stadium that was built just for this event. Yep, on the farm. 91,000 people, RCA arranged for live coverage of the fight on the only radio station that was commercially on at that time, KDKA Radio in Pittsburgh. The reason why the only, it was the only station that was in the George Westinghouse Laboratories, and they were developing radio. So it makes the event is the first quote-unquote national radio broadcast, even though it was only on, on one station. There's Dempsey. Dempsey was the king of the box office in those days, in 1921. Uh, it was a four-round knockout over Carpentier. No big deal fight in terms of the annals of fighting. However, the big news was the radio broadcast on July 2nd, 1921. Uh, it wasn't the first fight. This guy, Johnny Ray, was also on KDKA. The technology was, was KDKA. And Johnny Ray was in the first fight uh, against a guy by the name of Johnny Dundee in Pittsburgh, Motorick Square Garden. It's the first time anything was on radio. So Sarnoff knew it could work, but he rolled the dice, paying money for that other fight. Yeah? Is that the Dundee that became the ring? No. 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 Different Dundee? It's Angela Dundee, okay. somebody else totally. And that, uh, that guy is Harold Arlen. Harold Arlen would be the first radio announcer of a baseball game. Again, in Pittsburgh, KDKA, again, Pittsburgh Pirates are playing. And um, they experimented and experimented. Radio stations, it would become the Wild West eventually. Any radio station in any city that had a major league team or even a minor league team would try to broadcast games. That will end in 1939. Uh, with KQV in Pittsburgh. Uh, Arlen was an early broadcaster. He called the first baseball game 
He called the first football game, 1921, staff announcer on KDKA. His grandson, Steve Arlen, played baseball with the San Diego Padres in 1960s. Uh, sports, particularly baseball and boxing, would help fuel radio's rise. People would buy radios because they could hear Pittsburgh Pirates or they could hear Jack Dempsey fight. First baseball game, August 5th, 1921, again, KDKA. So all of a sudden, they're realizing, Sarnoff's of the world, it's realizing, hey, we give people product they want, in this case, a baseball game. They're going to buy our radio Oilers, which would become radio eventually. The 1921 World Series is the first World Series that was on KDKA and WJZ in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, the announcers, Grantland Rice and Tommy Cole, uh, Cowan, would not be at the game. They would get the game the old-fashioned way, by telegraph, and they would recreate the games in the studio. President Ronald Reagan recreated games of the Chicago Cubs on the radio station in Des Moines, WHO, in the late 1930s. Game recreations lasted until the 1960s. But anyway, uh, that game was actually uh, recreated, and they got their play-by-play -play account from the telephone wire. Uh, the first football game, actually, in the stadium was University of Pittsburgh beating West Virginia October 8, 1921, on KDKA. Now, the first real national game where people were at that was on a wired network was on New Year's Day, 1927. That was the Rose Bowl also on NBC. NBC would start two networks in 1926-27, the Red Network and the Blue Network. The Red Network would be for news, the Blue Network would be for entertainment. But David Sarnoff knew he needed sports. He got the World Series, he got games, uh, got boxing matches, he got football games. People were interested. And I'm gonna bring you up to uh, 2017. How many of you have Amazon Prime and watch football games on Amazon Prime? How many parents have Amazon Prime? Okay, do they watch football games? <clears throat> well, Jeff Bezos is doing the same thing David Sarnoff did. When you used to, in the 1800s, if you followed baseball, you know newspapers were a tremendous asset to baseball. In fact, Henry Chadwick is the guy who supposedly came up with scoring. It would not be unusual for you go to town, to town, to town, to town, and you would see this in front of a newspaper office, and they'd put up a baseball diamond here, and they would run the scores there, and they would put up updates of baseball games. Newspapers used baseball also to sell newspapers, but they would give you in the newspaper the actual account of the game, but if you really wanted to know what was going on in the game, you would stand in front of a newspaper like the Washington Post or the New York Journal American or a whole bunch of others back in the day, and you would be able to follow baseball, again, with the Telegraph, through what was going on uh, with the Washington Post. Baseball depended on newspapers, absolutely depended on newspapers, and newspapers sold baseball. Newspapers wanted the product, needed the product to sell their product, and they clung on to baseball. 19th century, it was critical role-making of the sport uh, because it pushed it as a social institute and a commercial one. Uh, newspaper journalists helped to standardize the rules of horse racing, baseball, and college football. 1923, big how did, group. How did they impact college football? Didn't the NCAA take care of it? There was no NCAA at that point. In I mean, there was, there was, but they promoted it. Newt Rothney. How was Newt Rothney promoted? Newspapers right, and, right. and radio, the Galloping Ghost, uh, the Four Horsemen of Notre Dame, all newspapers. The Four Horsemen, you know what the Four Horsemen of Notre Dame is? They were four guys, running backs and quarterbacks, for Newt Rockney's Notre Dame football team in the mid-1920s. Rockney was a great coach at that time, and the Galloping Ghost and the Four Horsemen of Notre Dame helped popularize football because nobody cared about the NFL in those days. It was all about college football. Um, so all of a sudden, you got baseball 
coming through the telegraph and then telephone. Next step would be radio. W-E-A-F. In New York, did that. So 1921, 22, 23 World Series were on two stations and then a third station in 1923. And all of a sudden, baseball takes off on radio. Right. But they were in two stations, but you could yeah. hear it nationwide. You could hear it nationwide at that point. I hope you know who the guy on the right is. The babe. He's the only guy you know from the 1920s, I bet, from baseball. Lou Gehrig? Ty Cobb? I know a couple, not many. But anyway, the Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth is the selling point for NBC. He's in the World Series. People want to know about Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth revolutionized the game, hitting home runs. All of a sudden, baseball, after the 1919 World Series betting scandal fix, was looking for somebody to lift the game. Babe. Babe and radio did so in the 1920s. In Cincinnati, this guy in the middle is a guy by the name of Pal Crosley. Pal Crosley was probably the most influential radio station owner in the United States in the 1920s and 30s. He had two stations in Cincinnati, one WLW, which to this day carries Cincinnati Reds games, and he had another station devoted. You think WFAN was the first, first station devoted only to sports? This guy did it way back when in the 1930s. Pal Crosley, he was a radio manufacturer. Your grandparents, great-grandparents probably had one of his radios, which was called the Crosley uh, Cathedral, which opened up like a cathedral when they used to quote-unquote watch radio. Uh, and he was looking to get more consumers, looking for more and more consumers. How do you get consumers? Now, I've laid it out. How do you get consumers to buy your radios? You got it. You need product. He got product. He got product. He had probably one of the biggest dance programs on. 700 on the dial boomed right throughout the country. Still does today. But he was looking for consumers to buy his product, and he knew he had to go out and get some things to buy his product. He buys two radio stations. That was a, one of his radios called the Crosley Playboy. He used to have a cathedral radio. That's what uh, you would listen to back in those days. 1934, he owns two radio stations and he buys the Cincinnati Reds baseball team. With that, Crosley becomes the first owner of a radio station to approve of doing all 160, 154 games back in the 1930s because he's got three hours a night that he needs to fill up. It's the Depression. People aren't spending money necessarily to go out to the ballpark. It's the Depression but they're listening to the games on the radio. And you listen to the games on the radio, there are commercials. So he can make his money up with less attendance through the commercials on the radio station that he owns. The other one he owned was WSAI. And they actually did the Reds games. And the call letter stood for Sports and Information. He's selling that radio station based on what? Sports. That's what he wants. That's what he's selling it on. So that's 1934 with Crosley Powell. Now, Powell gets the team in 34. Larry McPhail also had a piece of the team, and he sold the club uh, to Crosley. Uh, it was a match made in economic heaven. McPhail knew that you put the games on radio, you get more interest. People will become interested in Cincinnati Reds baseball games. And it would promote the team. Promote the team. You get a three-hour commercial every day. What do you, even if you don't listen to games on radio now, and your generation doesn't, but you do on phones, right? You listen to games on phones? Yeah. You watch the games? Watch, yeah. You watch. Okay, let me ask you a question. Is that a baseball game, basketball game, hockey game, football game, soccer game, or is that a three-hour commercial? What is it? Think of it. What is it? Commercial or a game? Well, if you look at it realistically, all you have to go back is to Larry McPhail in 1933. Just read the quote. Broadcasting games would promote the team. Crosley now could boost his ratings. So it's a marriage made in heaven. 
Although in the 1930s, a lot of baseball owners, particularly in New York, refused to put games on radio. Why? Because they thought it would take away from attendance. However, putting games on radio heightened interest in the team, and more people came out to watch a game after they heard it on radio and got to know players through radio play-by-play -play accounts. So there's a synergy here. So again, I'm going to ask that question. Is it a three-hour commercial when it's on radio or TV or your phone, or is it a game? Commercial. It's a commercial. Three-hour commercial. <clears throat> so this is in baseball. Football, how many of you sit around on Sundays or Monday nights or Thursday nights or Saturday during the day and watch college or pro football? <coughs> okay, virtually everyone. How did, how's that delivered to you, by the way? Is it delivered by TV? Delivered by phone? How do you get the games? Both. Amazon Prime? Fox Sports. Fox Sports. Okay. It's a guy by the name of G.A. Richards. He owns WJR Radio in Detroit. He buys a bankrupt football team from Portsmouth, uh, Ohio, and moves them to Detroit. And he's not drawing too many people. It's not going over all that well in Detroit. But there's Thanksgiving. And the parade outside of, in Detroit, the Thanksgiving Day parade, actually ends up in front of the stadium that uh, he's playing in. His Lions are playing in. So all of a sudden, he's got this parade going, and he decides, he asks the NFL, can you move this game from Sunday to Thanksgiving, 1934? Not only can you do that, we can do something else for you. We'll put it on WJR, and we're part of the NBC radio network. So being part of the NBC radio network for the National Football League, you could get exposure on Thanksgiving for your product in 1934. He gets 26,000 fans to see the Lions play, but more importantly, the game is heard on 94 different radio stations around the country. Now, if that game is heard on 94 different radio stations around the country, what does that mean? It means exposure, right? It means exposure. It also means to David Sarnoff over at NBC, I got 94 stations, I could charge more money for commercials because I have more volume out there listening. And oh, by the way, there may be more people buying radios because all of a sudden I got football games. So the question is, his uh, advertising was national, not yes. local yes. at the time? Well, we're going to talk about advertising. Wheaties. People still eat Wheaties? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There used to be a Wheaties song, you know. Jack Armstrong, All-American Boy, was a fictional character, but he was an All-American Boy. Wheaties starts its association with advertising in baseball on the national level in 1933. By 1946, Gillette, Gillette was rich enough to sign a 10-year, $14 million contract with NBC for exclusive radio sponsorship of the World Series and the All-Star Game. So, got your answer? Well, no, I was just, yeah. because they had 94 stations, yeah. I assume some of that advertising was at was the local. Was local, yeah, but the national, you know, yeah. again, national level and with some local availabilities by 1946. Now, not everybody was too thrilled with this thing called radio, particularly baseball owners. Uh, some cities had two teams, like Boston. So when Boston, the Red Sox and the Braves, when the other team was on the road, some were home, and they didn't want the conflict in Boston, nor did they want the conflict in New York with three teams, because they felt if fans could hear a game on radio, they were less likely to attend the game in person. McPhail proved that wrong. By 1939, all three New York teams were on radio. They were the last three teams in Major League Baseball to be on radio, 1939. That's uh, Judge Landis, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who was the commissioner of baseball, who was brought in after the 1919 World Series scandal. And Landis uh, has some mixed records. You record. might just mention yeah. that scandal. Yeah. 1919. You know about eight men out and how the 1919 World Series was fixed? The Black Sox. With the Black Sox. How many of you know the story of the Black Sox? So very few. Okay. 
basically there were eight guys on the White Sox that plotted together to throw the World Series. Actually, it wasn't eight. It was Chick Gandell and a couple others, but there were a couple others who overheard it, and Joe Jackson, who the argument has been since he was thrown out of baseball in 1920, he should be in the Hall of Fame. He was somehow involved with this thing. Anyway, White Sox are playing the Cincinnati Reds, best of nine series, and allegedly the games were thrown. Uh, some of the games were thrown. Some of the games were played legitimately because the gamblers didn't pay off some of the White Sox players. Nobody really, everybody knew what was going on because gambling and baseball were taking place since the 1860s. There were players who were thrown out of baseball in the 1860s. Gamblers hung around hotels, hung around baseball players. There are a whole bunch of guys who ended up throwing games through 1919, and then afterwards as well. But Landers was brought in to quote unquote clean up the game, um, which he did kind of, sort of, but uh, he did other things like stop Negro players from entering Major League Baseball. So his record is mixed at best. Uh, but Landis signed a deal in 1935 that allowed the World Series to be on radio. And it was NBC, the baseball, NBC, David Sarnoff paid $400,000. This is depression money. In 1935, $400,000 uh, to do the World Series over a four year period. That's a lot of money back then. That's $100,000 a year back in the 1930s. So stations, here's the problem what happens, and this has to end for baseball and for sports. Stations in any city decide they can send employees to games and report live on the games. The owners ask the FCC to revoke the licenses of those stations because they were broadcasting games without the court's permission. The FCC punted, but the owners of the Pittsburgh Pirates didn't punt. And in 1939, this is where everything changes as far as rights fees go. 1939, the Pittsburgh Athletic Company against KQV Radio, which just went off the air in Pittsburgh because they couldn't afford the format, which was all news, decided that baseball broadcasts were private property. They could be sold to networks in individual stations. How many of you have heard that dis this disclaimer uh, that uh, the, this, the, this game is, the ex is presented by the, the exclusive rights of this baseball club? Any reproduction, retransmission is not allowed. How many of you heard that? So now you know where that comes from, 1939. That's when sports decided to protect the radio rights. It would extend into television. That's why multiple stations cannot do a baseball game, can't do a hockey game, a football game, base, or a basketball game. Television as well. Now you have radio.com and other gadgets where Washington Wizards have moved there, Washington Capitals have moved there, LA Kings, uh, they're with iHeartRadio, the Islanders and Devils are on uh, radio.com. Radio is not considered all that big a deal. In fact, the Oakland A's almost didn't have a radio contract this year. They don't care anymore. So it's private property. And David Sarnoff comes back. 1939, television starts in the United States. Now let me tell you something about television. Television was, uh, was first came out of the Westinghouse Laboratories. A guy by the name of Warkin uh, came up with something called the uh, Iconoscope. And by 1928, Philo Farnsworth basically perfected the TV tube. The scientists in Germany were also working on television. 1935, commercial TV starts in Germany, Nazi Germany. And let me ask you a question. What were the Nazis, what did they want to do with TV? What did they want to do with TV? Promote their agenda. Promote their agenda. And how do they promote their agenda? 1936, Berlin Olympics. They're going to show the mastery of the Aryan race. And they start television in 1935. By the Olympics in 1936, they have eight hours a day of Olympic coverage. Now, I'm not going to go into the 36 Olympics. That's an entirely different topic. However, they used it or tried to use it for propaganda purposes. They found that it was ineffective. Why? The televisions cost way, way, way too much money, and very few people had it. 
they jumped the experiment after the 1936 Olympics. But they, too, were going to use sports to advance whatever they wanted to advance. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of that, but if you look at the early days of TV, it was the Nazis that actually perfected TV to the point where you could show programming by 1935, 36. Sarnoff is about three years after that. The first uh, televisions in the United States, they were, actually, there were TVs in 1928 up in Schenectady in the General Electric Laboratories. That station now is WGY in Schenectady. But Sarnoff's got it all figured out by 1939. What did he do 18 years earlier? What did Sarnoff do 18 years earlier? He promoted, he bought the Jack Dempsey fight, right? Bought it because he wanted to sell radios. We got TV finally up and going. So what's Sarnoff's next move? TV's up and going. Broadcasting on TV. Broadcasting on TV with what programming? N NBC. Well, I, NBC, but what was he looking for? Well, the first televised baseball game, May 17th, 1939, Princeton and Columbia. About 400 television sets were around in those days. The first real sports program, the first real sports program was Gillette. Gillette bought the rights. Cavalcade of Sports premiered in 1944. And what did it premiere with? A boxing match. Willie Pep against Chalky White. Featherweight championship battle. I should have had my picture with me and Willie Pep together back 30 years ago. But anyway, so what is Sarnoff doing again? What's he doing again? You can talk to me. I'm asking you, what's he doing again? Same thing, Same thing he did in 1921. He's banking on sports. He's banking on other programming as well. But he's banking on sports to sell TVs. Although you couldn't really get a TV in 1944 because production of television stopped.